Hi everyone, my name is Jenny. Uh, I'm also from the DAS group. Um, today I'm going to talk about parallel I.O. So I will tell you a little bit of what is I.O. and some common I.O. issues at NERSC. And also show you what is the typical uh, HPC I.O. stack. And uh, talk a uh, little bit about the performance versus productivity. That's some uh, relatively new. Uh, also, I last one slide about one case study, which is uh, as seen as mysterious I.O. and how we solve their I.O. problem. So first, uh, what is I.O.? So I.O. can be some pretty, some beauty, like an uh, Indian Ocean. And I.O. can help you, help you make more money, right? Uh, now the, a lot of startups choose I.O. as their domain extension. There are millions of websites choose .io. What does I.O. mean? That, good question. That I.O. exactly means input and output. <laughs> <laughs> Similar <laughs> with what we mean here. And interestingly, uh, whenever I came across the border to come into the country, I was asked uh, uh, one question. What's your purpose of your trip? And I, I told the officer, uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm coming to this country to do my PhD study in I.O. And then the officer asked, explain that to me. So I point, that, point to, the, to his keyboard, and I said, that's the input. And what you see from the monitor, that's the output. And what is parallel I.O.? Clearly, how much for keyboard and uh, much for monitors. So that's how I. Uh, easily pass the border. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly, uh, I.O. cannot, uh, uh, it isn't that top secret like uh, nuclear technology uh, that can stop me from coming to this country. Also, it isn't something get, that can make you money. But why do we care about I.O.? So here I list some, com some common I.O. questions, or co common I.O. issues. So firstly, uh, user will ask, hey, you, you guys claim that your system, Cori, has a peak back bandwidth around 700 or more gigabytes per second. Why I could only get 1% of that? So that's a really common question. And, uh, and secondly, scalability. So I, if you get a little bit of I.O. knowledge, you know that with more I.O. processes, more storage servers, you potentially can scale your application to a larger scale but why the performance isn't actually scalable. And third, the metadata issue, file closing, mostly like uh, Lisa mentioned, there we have limited number of metadata server, that becomes the bottleneck of the metadata uh, performance. And last but not least, the pain of productivity. So uh, users came to us and said, I like to use and try Python, Spark, or TensorFlow for my data analytics, uh, Analy the data analysis job, but why uh, the I.O. seems slow. So those are all the typical and common I.O. Um, questions. And that's why I think that uh, before I really show you how to optimize I.O., I think it's important to like, explain the complex H HPC I.O. stack, why the I.O. can become a bottleneck. So there are two major factors that really uh, bring this I.O. issue. Firstly, we have a complex HPC I.O. stack. And uh, we know that we have some hardware uh, in downstairs. And when we, we know that we can run our application in the system. So between the two layers, there are a bunch of I.O. stack, I.O. middleware. So including parallel file system, uh, Lisa also mentioned that. And uh, I.O. middleware, like MPI I.O and also high-level I.O. library, like HDA5, NCDF, audios. And also, nowadays, people start to use more Python, which offers productive, a productive interface, like uh, H5Pi. So, so all those layers come together to serve your application and run on this uh, uh, part of uh, hardware, part of file system. So this is really complex. And whenever your application issues some in data request, input or output request. It has, goes, has to go through those hierarchical stack. And anything happens in the between can slow down your I.O. 
So that's one of the major issues that I/O is not uh, trivial and sometimes will be bo um, uh, bottleneck. So the second major factor is the is the difference between human and uh, machine in which how we describe the real world problem. So for scientific data, uh, typically we we try to describe the model close to uh, close to the way that we are familiar with. For example, for climate science, we have 3D data, right? And latitude, longitude, and height. That's how we describe the uh, weather or climate. But hardware, on the hardware layer, it only can understand bytes. So that's the difference and mismatching between the, the application and the hardware. And those are the two major factors that really bring some I.O. issue here. And that's also why we need a lot of middle layer to bridge the mismatching between application and the hardware. So here's the secret of slow I.O. So uh, looking at the, uh, the, at the disk level, so we, you often will hear about the contiguous I.O. and non-contiguous I.O. So what does that mean? So look, uh, from the disk level, when we talk about contiguous I.O., it means the data are located closely. And whenever you want to read something, imagine you have an image. And when you store that image onto disk, if it's stored in the row major, by con contiguous I.O., we mean that we can read from the first byte contiguously, contiguously first row, second row, and the, second, uh, and the third row. In case of non-contiguous I.O., uh, that means you want to read the image column by column and result in such kind of a uh, uh, non-contiguous I.O. pattern. So in this case, the disk will have to read the f some block and then, jump, uh, then move, jump to another block and it will shake a little bit. That causes some latency. So in this simple calculation, you can see there it's quite dramatic uh, difference between contiguous I.O. cost and non-contiguous I.O. cost. But the story is, t is totally different on SSD because they have no moving parts. Uh, but I think I will focus on the traditional HPC hardware and the next, uh, next session, uh, Wahid will talk more about burst buffer. So uh, we did some study and we I think the I.O. challenge will become more severe in the next few years, in 2020 or 2025. So here's the simple data. So if currently your application produces like 10 to 100 terabytes of data, so two years from now, that application can produce three times more data. Seven years from now, it will be 22 times more of data. So given that, that huge amount of data, how to efficiently load the data into memory to continue your, your data analysis, that will be challenging. So the file system comes in to really leverage the uh, multiple disk, multiple object storage servers that can bring some parallelism and performance to your application. And uh, at NERSC, we uh, used uh, Luster and GPFS. Those are the also, those are the really uh, popular parallel file system in, across uh, all those uh, HPC facilities. And that's a layer right on top of the IO hardware. And so this, is di this diagram shows uh, our current architecture. So we have a Cori King Haswell and Cori King L. Th those two partitions both connect to the same LNet router, which is 130 servers. That L LNet router can redirect your I/O request to the storage to through the parallel file system Luster. And totally, we have 248 object storage servers. And uh, also, as Lisa, Lisa mentioned, we can try to 
spread your data on more object storage servers uh, with the simple command like uh, stripe large uh, dot means your current directory. You can specify your data to be uh, stored on 72 OST instead of just one OST. And to check those striping information, you can simply type LFS get stripe dot to get the current striping information of your uh, current directory. And one layer on top of a parallel file system is the IO middleware. So IO middleware comes in to really bring some uh, optimization and uh, uh, IO scheduling and uh, algorithm to speed up your IO. For example, in MPRL layer, they provide a collective IO and non-blocking non IO. Uh, by default, so application typically will use just independent IO, so in which all your processes from the application will do the IO by themselves without any coordination. And if we turn on the collective IO, all the processes before they actually access or read the data, they will start communication first. They will share their access information to, to figure out the optimal way to access the data. And mostly, collective IO can optimize your non-contiguous IO if you access the data uh, non-contiguously then turn on collective IO can sometimes bring the performance benefit. But still, sometimes we will use, we want to use independent IO because uh, collective IO can bring, because there is a communication phase, it can cause some synchronization cost. And uh, so on top of uh, IO middleware, uh, we have this uh, high-level IO library. So I would say that that layer is more, close, uh, is more closer to, to human being, to your data. So for example, HDF5. Uh, whenever we talk about HDF5, it's not just uh, IO. It, it is a data model. So that layer can help you describe your problem easily and also can manage your IO, manage the IO for you. So you don't have to worry a lot about the MPI IO details, how to turn on collective IO, how to figure out the layout and the set the file view, something like that. You can just use HDF5 to focus on your data and your problem. And the IO part can be well handled by HDF5 internally. And from, by using HDF5, we want to um, try parallel I.O. You simply add those uh, red lines. And uh, that can immediately change your serial code into a parallel code. And last, is about the productive interface. So you may hear about Spark, that is uh, really a big data framework, and TensorFlow, and you can try that, use that for your deep learning application, and so on. So for using those kind of a productive uh, uh, software, uh, you have to uh, pay attention to their IO interface. And Mostly, we provide some recommendation for those uh, productive uh, software. For example, H5Py. That's the uh, productive interface at the Python layer. And also, uh, TensorFlow IO. We have, uh, at NERSC, we have people working on that. So it will be released soon. Excuse me. Yes, sure. Back on the first slide. Uh -huh. So here you have engines to only for some specific file format. Right. But if we want to write in the standard text okay. file, in text the file, okay. How, how can we do that? Uh, which uh -huh. you have to use? Good question. So mostly text file or other um, file formats that 
popular in commercial world are well supported in those e existing software. But for running that on HPC environment, we want to leverage the parallel file system. In order to do that, we have to leverage the parallel I.O. And typically, those like test file interface I.O. plugin it isn't uh, well supporting those parallel I.O. feature. So we typically try to convert those text files into the HDF5 format that we can well support that just because that we have some nice parallel I.O. interface on top of that. So what you mean is probably we should drop the standard uh, stream to some of this uh, form type format? Sorry, can you uh, We should drop the uh, standard uh, C++ upstream uh -huh. to some of these uh, functionalities. Um, is it your statement? I, I don't understand. So you are. So should, they, should they, they stop using OF stream and just switch <laughs> everything to HDFI? Um, I think you. It depends. So some people say we don't have any I/O problem because their data is tiny. They can immediately load that into memory. So really, in that case, you don't want to bother with parallel I/O and turning on MPI I/O, something like that. So in that case, probably stick with your, what you have. But in case you will produce like 100 gigabytes, like even terabytes, so you really want to think about the file format and the I/O piece will work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And here's a, some example for using H5Pi. And for example, turning on collective I/O with one line of code with data set collective, then you can really leverage and benefit from the collective I.O. And some coding com effort comparison. Left is uh, H5Pi, right is written in HDF5C. And you can see that uh, the first few block map to the entire page of the right. And then second few, uh, few lines point to another page. And the last few lines uh, map to another a third page. So you can see in terms of coding effort, uh, writing in H5Pi or Python can really uh, be productive. But in terms of performance, the question is again is that when you gain some productivity, how much performance you would afford to lose? And we did some study. We found that most cases, um, it's OK. The Python layer doesn't add too much overhead to the C layer. But in some cases, in case of a metadata-heavy operation or communication-involved uh, operation, there is some performance loss in using this productive interface. Last slide. OK, so it's about Asina's I.O. Asina is an astrophysical code and used wide in wide range of problems, like interstellar medium, star formation. And uh, when the user first came to us, he asked, uh, I want to know how much I.O. is taken in my code. Uh, it, I want to see if there is some I.O. bottleneck. Then I used Darshan. So that's also something we recommend for profiling I.O. I simply uh, profiled his code and sh uh, showed him this plot. And we found that. 40% of his code is doing I.O., which is uh, useless. And for years, his code is wasting the time, wasting his time in doing those input and output. But really, they care about the analytics and care, they care about the science, right? And so I made, uh, sorry. Mm, then later, we also figure, we figured a little bit details about, the, about this code's I.O. pattern. We found that every few, second, every few minutes, this could produce a tiny HDF5 file. The I/O pattern is what we call non-contiguous, and uh, the number of processes is, is thousand. And then we try to turn on the collective I/O. And uh, here is what the user uh, emailed us. So the user made the change, and he found he actually solved his problem. So the I/O take forty percent of the time, and now basically is zero. Okay, thank you. If you have uh, any question, feel free to email our uh, 
consult, uh, uh, look at this website, and you can easily find us. Thank you.